Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu. This month, we are diving into pediatric electrolyte emergencies. TR and I will sit down and go over all of those based on the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice article from February of 2023. And while we're on that topic, have you been to ebmedicine.net? You have subscription options for three different publications, and $50 is the difference between one and all three subscriptions. And in addition to that, clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net is quickly growing to be your one-stop shop for clinical pathways for all of your emergency medicine and urgent care needs. If you haven't been there yet, go check it out. Take a look at those pathways that will guide you through a step-by-step approach to most major medical problems that we face in both of those locations, and there are so many more coming. I can't wait for you to see it while you're there. Leave us some feedback. Let me know how you like it. And always, thanks for listening. Now, let's dive into pediatric electrolyte emergencies. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back again. I'm Sam Ashu, and this is T.R. Eckler. TR, say hello. I'm really excited to be back. Every time we do these, I feel like I say, I'm really excited about this issue. But I would tell you that having just really gotten very excited about checking people's magnesiums to the point where the nurses now order magnesiums on my patients from triage for me, I think that this is a great episode for me. Fantastic. Today, we are talking about the February 2023 article in Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice titled Pediatric Electrolyte Emergencies, Recognition and Management in the Emergency Department, thankfully authored by Dr. Thomas Conway. And I have to say, this is another one of those topics that has been exceptionally well covered in a very large article that deals with really all of the types of electrolyte abnormalities that we might encounter in the pediatric population. Much of it actually applies to adults as well when we get into treatment here. It's not necessarily unique to pediatrics, but the case presentations deal with some of the pediatric presentations we might encounter, and it is exhaustive how much information there is in here. The tables are excellent. The summaries are excellent. Even just the section that discusses the critical appraisal of the literature, over a thousand articles reviewed, I can't even count how many different systematic reviews from the Cochrane Library, guidelines released from the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics, so many things that were reviewed in order to create this article. I just can't stress enough. If you have access to it, you need to bookmark this one and keep it very, very close to you. There are some outstanding tables, and it's a fantastic article. That said, the article covers electrolyte abnormalities of sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and phosphate, and then discusses the presentation that we might see that would cause those derangements and how they present in the emergency department. And I really liked table two, which is a large summary of the electrolyte abnormality and then also the etiology and differential diagnosis. So everything we're going to talk about today is in that table. And it's a great summary for this article. It was an entire week of medical school on one three-quarter page. With then the next one, I actually really thought the table one was important too, the basically the table next to it, because I think I tend to get so focused on serum levels of things as an ER doctor, you forget to consider like what is in the interstitium, And then that really does start to change in terms of how it's affecting them. And I think that's important to keep a bigger physiologic consideration when you're looking at these imbalances as to what you're trying to replete and where you're trying to replete them. Yeah, that's a great point. We often talk about the shifts in these electrolytes. And Table 1 talks about the composition of body fluids. There's the extracellular fluid, there's the interstitial fluid, and then there's the intracellular fluid that are listed there and the varying levels of each electrolyte in all of those fluids. So another great table in this article. Before we dive in, I just want to say there's a lot in this article. And to stick it all into a one hour or less podcast would be detrimental to you, the listener. So I highly recommend you go and read this article, bookmark it, look at it in the mobile app, tag it for something you can access quickly. It is 
jam-packed and it really is a thorough review of all of these electrolyte emergencies. We are going to review some of these here in the podcast today, maybe discuss some clinical cases, but walking you through this thing would just be an exhaustive project and I just don't think I could do it justice. So please go read it. Let's talk about the sodium derangement. So this is something we see commonly in adults, especially in the geriatric population. People are on multiple medications, but it is actually also common in pediatrics. Most of the time we're looking at this, it's gastroenteritis or gastrointestinal losses resulting in some derangement of sodium. When we think about hyponatremia, so low sodium in a pediatric patient, the losses there could certainly occur from diuretics or diuresis. So if you work at any kind of tertiary center or a place that sees critically ill children, there are those who have congenital heart diseases and could be on diuretics. And I think the article actually made a good point of stressing the history from the parent, because sometimes the parents have made some assumptions, meaning the parents might think, oh, I've been here before. You've already looked through the electronic medical record. You know my child is on furosemide and digoxin and has a congenital heart problem. And honestly, sometimes they've walked in, they've told that to the triage nurse, they've told that to the nurse in the room, they've told that to the tech who hooked the child up to a monitor. And then by the time you get there, they think, oh, you, you should already know this. I've told this to five people already. But oftentimes that communication just isn't good or the electronic medical record doesn't have a great way of conveying that back and forth. And so if you haven't had a moment to examine the electronic medical record, you may walk into a room not knowing the history of this child thinking, oh, it's a one-year-old child. I mean, you know, what medical problems could they have? I'm just going to go straight in the room and talk to mom. And then you get this look like uh, you, you do know they have congenital heart disease, right? So, so important questions to ask in the history. I think to zoom out just for one minute as we're talking about this, I think that patients you're talking about, I have a special place in my heart for because my sub I, when I was in medical school, they didn't have room in the PICU for me and I was between peds and emergency medicine. So I ended up doing a pediatric cardiac intensive care sub I when I was a fourth year medical student. And all I did was basically like baby hearts all day long for a wow. month. And it was humbling and it gave me a profound appreciation for what their normal vitals are and what medicines they're on and how careful you need to be about their electrolytes and their mag and their FOS. And so I think that those patients, especially like you said, make sure you know their medicines and make sure you're a little more thorough in checking their electrolytes. But to just to start with for these, I think for sodium, the biggest ones that I worry about, which was beaten into me when I was in residency, is young athletes. Because there are so many athletes that are doing such bigger, longer distance races now, marathons, ultra marathons, Ironman. And if they're not taking salt in during those races and they're only drinking water because they either don't know they need electrolytes or whatnot, you really need to be cautious in that athlete when they come in. It was beaten into me when I got a chance to volunteer at the New York City Marathon that no athlete gets fluids without an eye stat. And I mm -hmm. think in this day and age, your ability to diagnose some of these things is much faster given some of the bedside labs that you have. And I think that every time that you can get an eye stat on these patients, I don't think it should tell the full tale. And I think you should remain suspicious even if the eye stat looks okay, there's something going on. But I think your chance to catch things early and make sure that you're pleading especially when we talk about hyponatremia. There's so many club drugs now where people drink a lot of water and there's so many athletic events where people can overdrink and overhydrate and end up really low in sodium. I think it's important just to start with that idea that, all right, let's see what information I can get as quick as I can. Yeah, and the article did a good job of touching on point of care testing and the literature behind it. There is good literature to support that it is reliable and that the testing numbers are accurate and that they can even be performed on samples drawn from IO lines. So certainly something to have available to use. The biggest advantage to using them is the rapidity of the test. So being able to get that information very quickly, but it doesn't actually supplant the need for main laboratory routine chemistry testing. It just is going to give you that head start on treating whatever the problem is, but you still need the extended complete metabolic profile and everything else that you're going to send to the main lab, especially when there's an electrolyte derangement. 
because you need to figure out that differential, which for hyponatremia is not just your insensible losses in a small child or an infant, not just your gastroenteritis, nausea and vomiting, certainly diuretic use, but things like adrenal insufficiency. You might be seeing them for the first time in this kind of presentation. Proximal renal tubular acidosis, which is a challenging diagnosis to make in the emergency department. They could have a first-time presentation for SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. Or it could be something like a formula mixing problem. So really nephrotic syndrome and congestive heart failure and liver failure, those things are hopefully a little bit easier to pick up depending on the age of the patient, listening for crackles and rels or looking for pulmonary edema and enlarged cardiac silhouette on x-ray, maybe have a palpable liver edge, all these things suggesting that there's excess fluid in the system and this is dilutional hyponatremia. So lots of causes for this particular abnormality, but trying to figure out volume status is challenging in and of itself. Sure. And I also think to go with that, getting a sense of the acuity or chronic nature of the sodium deficit, whether it's high or low, if it's something that's happened fairly quickly from something athletic or something where the acutely the patient had normal labs a couple of days ago, and then something changed in terms of medicines or, or whatever they were doing, and then now their level's much different, you can replete that fairly quickly. Whereas if this is a chronic problem, you need to be much more careful. And I think especially for children and for elderly patients, I'm a lot more cautious about how aggressive I'm going to be with fluids if I don't have a sense of when the last time this was a normal level for them. And I'm a lot more cautious about reaching out to my pediatric ICU people and saying, hey, help me make sure that we land this where you want to land it for the next few hours. Because I think that that's always the best way to make sure that as soon as you're going to start down a road that's going to lead into the next several hours and lead into the PICU, that you're already in agreement with where that plan's going to go. Yeah, that's a great point. There is a pretty big potential to screw this up in children, I think even more so than in adults. In an adult, I could give a bolus of a liter or something of that sort. And even in the severely hyponatremic person, the chances that that's going to lead to that dreaded central pontine myelinolysis from just a one liter bolus are still small. But as, as you start mixing in the pediatric population, we're talking about very small doses of fluids. There's increased chances for dosing errors. There's increased chances for nursing errors to accidentally give a little bit too much. And you could get some seriously rapid correction of hyponatremia. Now, we're primarily concerned with hyponatremia under 120 milliequivalents per liter. So that's where alarm bells start to go off for most people. The presentation here can be just nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, maybe lethargy, certainly altered mental status. Patients can have signs of dehydration if it's hypovolemia associated. So if they have a history of gastroenteritis or if this is as a result of adrenal insufficiency, but they might also be euvolemic, which means they're not actually dehydrated on physical examination. And again, this is going to have vague complaints but things like syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, formula mixing problems are known to cause euvolemic hyponatremia. And then the neurological findings get worse as the sodium drops. So under 120, you're thinking of things like altered mental status, seizures, coma. And then we, that is the area where we start talking about rapid correction of these disorders. So table three here runs through hypovolemic, euvolemic, and hypervolemic causes of hyponatremia. The hypervolemic side is things like congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, ascites, nephrotic syndrome. So things that you need to keep in the back of your mind when you see the low sodium, if it clinically fits with hypovolemia and the history fits, then that's, you know, that's okay. I think the most common cause there is still going to be some kind of gastroenteritis. But again, if you're at a center where you're seeing critically ill children, or you're a tertiary referral center, then you really need to keep that differential quite wide because you're far more likely to see some of these children referred to you than I think if you're in a routine emergency department. And then certainly if you're out in a rural center and you have no access to anything, then, then keeping that differential broad is equally as important so that you can begin treatment in the right direction. If they're 
hypervolemic, then giving that fluid bolus is not helpful. And you're actually looking at things like diuretic therapy. If they're hypovolemic, then you want to give the fluid and you want to avoid the diuretic therapy. If they're euvolemic, you're looking for some specific treatment and not necessarily IV fluid boluses. So it does become important. I would add two things to that. One, I really find that a lot of times in the acute patient, when you're not quite sure and you've got that seizing patient that you're worried, man, maybe this is sodium because you've given benzos, you've checked their sugar and nothing's really changing and they're still seizing. I think having that hypertonic saline bolus in your back pocket is something you're like, all right, I'm going to try some saline here because I'm still waiting for the ISTAT. The patient's still seizing and doing a weight-based bolus in children of that is going to be fine. But I find it reassuring that Sometimes I'll ask nurses to give a bolus of hypertonic saline to an adult, to a kid, and that's something that they rarely do. And they're saying, ah, I just don't feel comfortable with that. But if you then say, all right, well, can we do bicarb? That's always something that they're much more comfortable with. And I think that if you've got a seizing child, you suspect a seizing adolescent, you suspect that it could be their sodium level being low. I think making sure that you give an appropriate weight-based bolus for that is, is really something that's going to help. And I think having some sort of app that you rely on for looking at weight-based dosing in children. I love PD stat for that, but I think making sure that you try to make that as simple on yourself as you can is really a big, big thing that really will save you with tough cases like these. Yeah. Having access to something like you mentioned PD stat or MD calc even has a tool for calculating electrolyte corrections and water deficits. And so you can also correct sodium for hyperglycemia if their glucose is up. Now, if they're, as you mentioned, if they're seizing and their sodium's under 120, hypertonic saline or 3% saline is dosed at three to five milliliters per kilogram. And the initial approach is just to stop the acute neurological abnormality. So we're giving boluses slowly and we're giving them just to, to titrate until the seizure stops. And we're not looking for correction of the sodium to go back to completely normal at that point. And if you, again, if you correct it too rapidly, then we're liable to induce a, a locked in syndrome or an injury to the pons in the brainstem. And then as you continue to correct the sodium, the goal there is to increase it by no more than 0.5 milli equivalents per liter per hour. So it's a much slower correction. So give the 3% saline until the seizures stop. And then now we're going to go very slowly. And then we're going to gradually correct it with a maximum of 8 to 10 milli equivalents per liter over 24 hours. So it's a slow, slow process from there. So one more point about rural hospitals is I think, as you said, you're not going to have a pediatric ICU there. You're not going to have necessarily a pediatric nephrologist that will help you manage some of these things. But if you suspect it and you can put 75, 80 percent of the diagnosis together, I've found that almost always when you call your transfer center where this kid's going to land and you say, hey, I'm going to try to transfer this kid to you, but it's going to be hours to get an ambulance, to get all this figured out. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm thinking. What else would you want me to do here? I've found that always they are excited and happy to help you. And they're happy to give you kind of the parameters of what they want you to do now and what they want to wait on until they get there. And they always add one or two things that I would not have thought of in terms of adding on another lab or adding one more medication to stabilize the patient a little more. So I always think that once you've done most of the work and figured out the labs and started kind of resuscitating and stabilizing, I always think that even if you're going to transfer ER to ER, that you talk to the pediatric ICU team where this kid's going to land, it is going to save lives and it's going to make everyone happier because they get to be involved in the care earlier and they get to basically lay out a care plan that they're going to continue the way that they want it. And you're going to do a better job for your kids and your patients. On the other side of the spectrum is hypernatremia. So this is a high sodium. And again, just like the low sodium, this falls into three categories, the hypovolemic, the euvolemic, and the hypervolemic. And table four does a good job of breaking down the potential causes there. If they're hypovolemic, they have fluid losses. This is vomiting, diarrhea, overdiuresis, or inadequate intake. And if they are on the hypervolemic side, then we're looking at things like salt ingestion or intoxication or inappropriately concentrated formula. So they're, again, they're not mixing it correctly, but it's on the other side. And if they're euvolemic, then this is fluid losses from things like burns or sweating, respiratory losses, or even diabetes insipidus, which, again, thankfully, is not a diagnosis I have to make very often in the pediatric population. But 
the same differential to keep in mind. So identify the electrolyte abnormality, and then you have to identify the fluid status when it comes to sodium. Yeah, that was a big takeaway for me on this one. I think one point I would add, just because I find that sodium is the big launch point for these, where there's so much of our abnormalities are sodium. I think that one, I would want to caution everyone to be very aware of the pseudo hyponatremia you get with hyperglycemia. Because I think there's a lot of times where I'll see that sodium come back and I'm like, oh, geez, that's really low. But then when you look to their glucose and then you correct it, depending on how high that glucose is, that is oftentimes something that it, it'll come back at 117 or 115. And you're like, holy cow, but if their glucose is 1,000, you correct it, that's not a big deal. They're probably not going to seize from that. And then you can more aggressively hydrate that person because it's likely just that their sodium is low because of the glucose that's there. But I think that approaching these problems with a critical sense that you need to make sure the labs are correct and you need to make sure there's not something influencing the labs. We have so many patients sent in for hyperkalemia on labs that are hemolyzed as an outpatient. And I think before you in immediately initiate treatment on arrival, you got to check your labs and make sure that there's not an error that, that came in before. I, I had a patient transferred in from another hospital to me that came in on a hypertonic saline drip that, that they had instituted before. And I think the patient had a sodium initially of 115, something very low that it was reasonable to basically start them on a drip and try to bring them up. And we pulled labs on arrival, but they got pulled from the line where the hypertonic saline was. So the ISTAT sodium came back at 155. So we were concerned about overcorrecting. But when you looked at the amount that they had ordered, and this is why it's always important to look at pre-hospital to see what did the patient actually get? What was the volume? How much did they get? It didn't really make sense that the sodium would have gone up that much. And myself and our nephrology team here were kind of confused as to how we got this high. And what we realized is when we drew good labs from a new straight stick site, their sodium was still like 119, 120. Mm -hmm. Like it had only come up a little bit. And so before you react to your labs and immediately then go the other direction or start treating the hypernatremia that you have, I think it's especially in the age of an ISTAT, it's always good to get a good sample from a fresh stick and then see, do you really know what you think you know? Because I think this could have gone really badly for this patient. Yeah, absolutely. Another important point to keep in mind with hypernatremia or high sodium is fluid boluses. So we do not ever give boluses of hypotonic fluids. If you're going to give a fluid bolus, it's going to be normal saline. And in this case, the indication for fluid boluses would be something like hypotension and shock. So if the patient presents with a very high sodium, but they're hypotensive and in shock, that's an indication to give normal saline, 20 cc's per kilo boluses until your shock resolves. So until your hypotension is better, then you can switch to something like a hypotonic, a half normal saline, quarter normal saline, whatever it is that's required based on the patient's age and your sodium deficit calculation or your fluid deficit calculation and do that at a maintenance rate or a maintenance plus rate. So we're not bolusing hypotonic fluids. And if they're presenting with something like diabetes insipidus, then the treatment there is actually antidiuresis. And the only indication for fluid boluses in that scenario is, again, hypotension or severe dehydration. So don't bolus anything other than normal saline or, or LR, something that is balanced and not hypotonic. The other big category for electrolyte abnormalities, of course, is potassium. And so when we think about potassium, much like the sodium, it's either hypo or hyper. And the differential diagnosis there, again, well outlined in table two. Hypokalemia, we're talking about things like renal losses. So again, important to ask those questions. Are they on diuretics? Do they have a history of hyperaldosteronism? Or is this DKA? And gastrointestinal losses, have they been vomiting, having diarrhea, using a bunch of laxatives or laxative abuse? And this, again, is a pediatric population. So this would be given by parents for perceived constipation. And then shifts in extracellular and intracellular fluid, metabolic alkalosis, and beta agonist use. So again, they're getting multiple nebulizer treatments at home for severe bronchospasm or something of that sort. And they come in and you draw the labs and they've got terrible hypokalemia. That is temporary and not something that you necessarily have to jump right into and treat unless they're having some of those EKG abnormalities 
And this is another kudos for this article. There are some excellent images of EKG abnormalities. Figures one through three demonstrate all kinds of electrocardiographic abnormalities. Figure one shows you the changes we expect to see with hypokalemia, flattened T waves, prolonged QT intervals, and maybe even prominent U waves, depending on how severe the hypokalemia is. So lots of images there for you to look through and to memorize and then to keep handy for how to diagnose this if you're looking at an EKG and some of the changes you might encounter. And then treatment for hypokalemia, if you have an IV present, IV potassium chloride, 0.5 to 1 milli equivalent per kilo per dose, and then you're going to infuse this slowly over an hour or so. This stuff is usually caustic if there's peripheral IVs in place. Certainly can be given through IO lines as well. It can be painful, so large bore IVs are preferred. But again, in the pediatric population, sometimes you just take what you can get. And then if you get to the point where they can take oral replacement, especially if their potassium is only three, then you can provide them with oral supplementation, one to two milli equivalents per kilo per dose. And that's a great way to treat some things like hypokalemia. And in milder cases, even dietary supplementation is okay. Things like bananas, beans, potatoes, and avocados, all really potassium rich and are a perfectly acceptable way of supplementing. Have you ever done lidocaine through an IO for IO-related pain? I have not. Tell me. So a lot of times, rural critical access hospitals, bad dialysis patients, people where I couldn't get access on them, and I had to use an IO to stabilize them, I would tell you that giving medicines through the IO can be very painful, especially in kids when they don't understand. So you can give them basically a weight-based small infusion of just pain control lidocaine where you just infuse a little bit and then let it sit there in the IO and it numbs the IO site and around their bone and their tibia or their humerus, wherever it's going in. And that makes a huge difference in terms of their ability to tolerate any infusion, but especially something caustic like potassium. And in these kits, if you can get them to calm down, you can get their pain under control so you can give them an infusion get their veins to puff up a little bit, get their critical electrolyte you need to move up a little bit, you can get that into them. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, that's an excellent point. But I would stress the need to weight-based dose that because I'm comfortable giving a CC or two in adults, but in children, I would say I'd want you to look that up and be comfortable and make sure that your hospital is comfortable with what your protocol was for that because I think that varies a little more and, and I would want that to be something that people check themselves. Also important to keep in mind with hypokalemia is magnesium. So if you're treating hypokalemia and you're getting nowhere, <laughs> it's probably because you haven't okay. checked that magnesium level and you need to treat that as well. So I think it's Corey Slovis who always says hypo-K equals hypo-mag. And if you're not checking both, you're just not doing it right. So if you have hypokalemia, then that's something that's not on every hospital's complete metabolic panel. Sometimes you have to add it. And so it's something to keep in mind that if you're treating an electrolyte abnormality, especially potassium, or calcium, then you should check that mag and that FOSS, which are not usually in the metabolic profile. Having been in 12 hospitals now, I've never encountered a complete metabolic or a basic metabolic that had a magnesium. And I find that whenever I get pushback from nurses being like, why are you ordering this magnesium? Why do I have to add this on? I'm like, well, as soon as I stop finding one or two abnormal ones a day, then I'll stop. But every time I go looking, there's abnormal mags that need repletion. But to that point, do you order FOSS regularly in the ER? You know, I do not. And typically I'm looking for some other metabolic derangement that's going to require me to do it. So on the DKA patient or someone who's hypocalcemic or hypercalcemic, and it's going to help me tease out that differential, which we'll get into here in a few minutes, then it's typically an add-on. But I'm not routinely getting phosphorus levels unless there's an indication. I think I only really had it in my mind that I needed it for the dialysis patients, like in my renal patients, because that's what dialysis wanted. But I think, like you said, now I'm more inclined to look at it for DKA and I'm more inclined to look at it for my calcium abnormalities that are significant. And then some of the older people or younger people that I'm worried that really might have a refeeding syndrome because they haven't eaten or there's something that's really concerning about their weight loss picture or something else. I think really sick people are going to start getting fosses for me. I think that's going to be the benchmark. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the pediatric population, but again, if you're in a tertiary center and you're looking at 
pediatrics who are like the geriatrics. They're on multiple medications. They have heart disease. They might have renal disease. Then yeah, absolutely. That's another item that needs to be evaluated with every one of those presentations. In a time with more and more children coming as refugees, more and more doctors going to, to places where there are wars and crises, I think that the sick child coming in that may not have eaten in a long time and is really malnourished, I think that's something that I would want in the back of my head too is, okay, what are we capable of testing here? Can, yeah. I, can I see a mag? Can I see a FOSS? Yeah. Hyperkalemia, this is the other side of the spectrum with critically high potassium. Again, causes there are things like excessive intake from blood transfusion, or as you mentioned, if someone's coming in and they're already on a supplement of some sort, either oral or they're getting potassium supplementation and they're transferring in from another center. Decreased excretion, that happens from acute renal failure, kidney injuries, mineralocorticoid deficiencies and potassium sparing diuretics. Again, there should be a history of that, we hope. Shifts from intracellular to extracellular fluid, things like metabolic acidosis, muscle necrosis, if they've got rhabdomyolysis as the cause for the hyperkalemia, that's important to identify. So severe muscle soreness, some kind of history of overexertion or trauma, crush injuries, you know, those things are important to keep in mind. Medication induced from ACE inhibitors. Again, that's your congenital heart disease patients if they're on NSAIDs, if they're on digoxin. And then other things like hemolysis being at the top of the list. So as you mentioned earlier, making sure you check. And if it doesn't clinically fit, then maybe consider that this was just a hemolyzed specimen, especially if they have an IO line in place. As we mentioned before, the IO is reliable for point of care testing, for main lab testing, but it certainly can cause hemolysis. And the nature of the catheter and where it is and trying to draw samples out of it under pressure, you're going to get hemolysis quite frequently. So just make sure that that's getting checked. And if you're relying on a point of care specimen, they will not give you the hemolysis alerts that the main lab will. So main lab will tell you, oh, okay, this was a hemolyzed specimen. Now, there are those cases where, for example, they come in with an EKG abnormality. And again, this is very well outlined in figure two, where it talks about the peak T waves and decreased amplitude of the P waves, and eventually the drawing out of the QRS and out into the, the typical sine wave you get with critically high potassium levels when we're reaching above eight. And these are people who develop the life-threatening dysrhythmias. But if you're looking at one of those EKGs and it fits with the clinical history, and the lab calls and says, oh, this is a hemolyzed specimen, please get another one. I will often ask, just tell me what the machine spit out. I expect it to be eight, nine. And they'll go, oh, it's, it's just 7.7. 7. And I'll go, oh, okay, and then that's good enough for me. And that's not a hemolyzed specimen. So oftentimes, if it's a critically high specimen, you will just get an alert from the lab to say this is hemolyzed. And if they won't release the number to you, then sometimes the point of care testing is helpful in that scenario as well, because those machines will not just say this is hemolyzed, they'll spit out a number. But the inverse there is also important to remember that those machines will not tell you a sample is hemolyzed. So if you're doing a point of care test on a very well appearing child with a normal EKG and the potassium comes back at nine, you're going to go, eh, okay. And I think to your point, I, I think when you were talking about it, you said IOs, but I think IVs, IOs, the smaller that hole is, the more turbulence you have in there, the more hemolysis you're going to get. So especially in kids, you're using smaller lines, you're going to get more hemolysis. So if you can do a straight stick with a bigger needle and get a better set of labs, I always try to separate access from lab testing when things are difficult and I have sick patients because I find that you get better labs and a better line that you're not messing with. So I always try to keep that in mind for these kind of sick kids and just sick patients overall is, okay, you know, if I can't get great labs, great, we'll get access, then we'll figure out what's next. We'll do the IO if we can't get an IV in 10 or 15 minutes in someone that's very, very ill. And then we'll get as many labs as we can. And then we'll go back when we're a little more resuscitated and then try to get better labs from a straight stick. Because I think that that's an approach that's going to, again, the better data you get in these situations, the more likely you're going to make good decisions. And then the article does a great job of detailing hyperkalemic treatment in the emergent setting of EKG abnormalities. So I won't go through all of this, but again, just to keep in mind, when you have a critically hyperkalemic patient and you're looking at EKG abnormalities, you're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at them, which includes 
calcium gluconate or calcium chloride, depending on the access you have. Just remember those are caustic agents. And then insulin, bicarb, or giving glucose if you're going to give insulin so they don't get hypoglycemic. And mm -hmm. then beta agonists, certainly in nebulizer treatments that the beta agonists can shift 0.5 to 1 milliequivalent per liter. It's temporary, but it is helpful, especially if you have EKG abnormalities. And then other things to keep in mind are things like the oral potassium binders, which are not approved in children. So if you're treating hyperkalemia or critical hyperkalemia in children, you're looking at things like furosemide to improve diuresis and to improve renal excretion of the potassium. You're not giving the newer oral agents that are potassium binders. And the older agent, sodium polystyrene, is not recommended anymore. There's data that shows that there's very little change in potassium level that that actually provides and the negative effects with intestinal necrosis are just too risky for the benefit that you're going to get, maybe the benefit that you're going to get from that agent. So no oral agents in the pediatric population for potassium elimination. You're looking at things like IV furosemide. And I, I always think in kids too that I, I'm not giving D50 because that's too concentrated in pediatrics. So I tend to go to D10 when I'm thinking sugar and children. And I think that that's a good general rule to have in your head if you're trying to give kids a little sugar to try to, to manage and any kind of sugar situation is no D50 for kids, unless they're really like teenagers and then they're doing worse stuff to themselves at that point. <laughs> uh, and that's the big four. So that's low and high sodium and low and high potassium. Then we get into the low and high calcium levels. So hypocalcemia can actually be seen in conditions like sepsis. And so making sure you've got the broad differential is important, especially if they're hypotensive, maybe febrile or have an infectious source there. Yep. High phosphorus can also cause low calcium and low magnesium can cause low calcium. So again, another reason to get those two, if you get somebody with a low calcium level, then you want to add on that magnesium and phosphorus level. Some of the childhood conditions also are altered vitamin D, low serum albumin levels, which can give you a falsely low calcium level. So making sure you correct for that. And rickets, which I don't think I've actually ever seen in my clinical practice in the US. I have seen it abroad on some medical mission trips, but I've never seen it here in the US, thankfully. So all of those things should remain on your differential for the hypocalcemic patient. I'm going to prisoner that would always come in in Colorado who was a young woman that had terrible hypocalcemia from a number of different causes. But I remain forever grateful that I will never forget what a Schwastak or a Trousseau sign looks like because she would always have them and they'd be so bad and she would need such significant calcium repletion. And I got more and more comfortable knowing how much calcium to give and I think that that's the point of this article is you're not going to see a lot of these patients, but the few that you see, it's great to really embed in your brain. Like these are the things that I need to do. These are the treatments I need to do. And this is what I need to kind of broaden my differential and consider. It's really the key to this whole thing is you're going to see all this, just not very much of it, but it's so much better if you have reviewed it and you're ready for it. Yeah. Hypocalcemia is very interesting really, because the clinical presentation there, that's paresthesias, weakness muscle fasciculations, seizures, and tetany. So we don't often think of seizures. We think of that more in the sodium realm, but it can be caused by hypocalcemia. And then some of the specific examples, like you mentioned, are the schwastek sign or the Trousseau sign. The schwastek is the facial spasm when you tap on the cheek just a couple of centimeters anterior to the tragus. And then the Trousseau sign, you have to get a blood pressure cuff and inflate it to 20 millimeters of mercury for a few minutes, and then you'll get the carpal spasms following inflation. It was always just from checking her blood pressure, the nurses would throw the blood pressure on and she'd start yelling down the hall. And I would be like, oh, oh, she's got to be low. Like that's the blood pressure cuff setting her off. And it there was just go. something that like I knew. And then I was like, all right, well, let's, let's check her labs and then we'll get some repletion going. And then some of the other somatic changes, dry skin, eczema, brittle hair, nails, dental hypoplasia, but if it gets pretty severe, they can also get cardiovascular manifestations. So hypotension, you get myocardial depression and heart failure and some dysrhythmias. And that's usually associated with some pretty critical illness. And so things like hypoparathyroidism, and then we talked about sepsis, severe vitamin D deficiencies, 
and hyperphosphatemia. So the presentation there is quite broad for hypocalcemia as well. When we talk about testing, again, like we mentioned before, you can get an ionized calcium from an IO. That works, and that works very well. So don't worry about placing the IO, and don't worry that the IO is somehow going to be insufficient for that kind of testing. A routine calcium or total calcium that you get on your metabolic profile, again, you have to adjust for albumin. If you're really worried, get the ionized. And in some places, that's available point of care as well. So you can get it pretty rapidly. When it comes to diagnostic testing, again, an ECG can be helpful in that scenario. So we're looking at things like prolonged QT intervals, prolonged ST intervals, T-wave abnormalities in contrast with hypercalcemia, which is going to shorten everything. And since we're talking about hypercalcemia, that clinical presentation is going to differ a little bit. The common mnemonic there, stones, bones, groans, moans, and psychiatric overtones is mentioned in the article. And that basically breaks down to parathyroid hormone and increased bone breakdown for the bones, groans being gastrointestinal, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, maybe constipation. And these can be early signs. And the moans being fatigue, weakness, and lethargy, and the stones being renal stones or urolithiasis. And so those are the common findings you'll see with hypercalcemia and the triggers there being things like primary hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, thiazide diuretics. This gets me every time, every time, even in the adult population, when I find a a patient with multiple electrolyte derangements, it's my first question is always, okay, which thiazide are you on? So it's definitely a common cause for multiple electrolyte derangements. And then vitamin A ingestion. So if you're looking at somebody with a potential overdose, then hypercalcemia is a huge problem and vitamin D toxicity. So again, you're looking at somebody with a potential overdose, then you're going to have to deal with multiple electrolyte derangements in that scenario. And, and as you said, like so much of this is the history. We've had our computers shut down here for a week and it's taken me back to the time when all you really have is you and the patient and you just have to sit there and work the problem and, and just keep asking good questions. Like, have you recently started or stopped any medications? Did you run out of your home medications? Is there anything you're supposed to be taking, but you haven't been taking it recently? And almost always these hypercalcemic patients are like, well, yeah, I'm supposed to be on some medicine for my calcium, but I ran out. But, you know, I'll get I'll get to it in a while. And their calcium is 15. And you say, why don't you get to it a little sooner? That's but right. I think I think in these kind of cases, the answer is always with the patient. If you're not quite sure, like you can't quite put it together, go back, you talk to the patient, you check where the labs came from, you check their lines, you, you examine them to see what their volume status is, you examine them for more clinical signs. And I think that more often than not, you're going to get most of the way home there. Just when you think you haven't quite put it together, just go back and push a little bit further and you'll get the answer from mom and dad. They'll tell you what they're doing with the formula. They'll tell you that they started this new vitamin that's supposed to be great off the internet. And then you'll realize that, that there's a lot of A, D, E, or K in there that they probably don't quite need. And treatment in both of those conditions, they're hypocalcemic. Again, you're looking at calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. The Gluconate is less caustic in the peripheral IV than the chloride is. That dosing is mentioned in the article. Uh, if they have some kind of hypoparathyroidism or other endocrine derangement, then that's very specific treatment. If they're hypercalcemic, their calcium is high, then the initial treatment is actually just IV fluid resuscitation. So you're giving that 20 cc per kilo bolus of normal saline. And then you're also using diuretics to encourage the urinary excretion of calcium as well. There are bisphosphonates and other medications that you can give. And typically at that point, you're involving somebody from pediatric critical care or nephrology or something of that sort. Yeah. So endocrinology, critical care. And you're making it. lots of calls. <laughs> All right. And then let's talk about magnesium. So we mentioned this earlier when we're looking at somebody who's hypomagnesemic, things like chronic diarrhea, malabsorption, drug-induced renal losses, or any one of the other electrolyte derangements we've mentioned. You know, calcium derangements can also be caused by low magnesium. And so the presentation there is interesting. There can be neurologic manifestations. They can actually get paresthesias, weakness, and muscle fasciculations, and seizures. And I think that kind of goes hand-in-hand -hand with the hypocalcemia as well. 
and then the cardiac arrhythmias, PVCs, ventricular tachycardia, and then, of course, the worst, we're looking at things like torsade de point or ventricular fibrillation. And in those kinds of cases, we're talking about rapid correction of hypomagnesemia and giving boluses of magnesium. And in the pediatric population, that is mag sulfate, 25 to 50 milligrams per kilo per dose, and you can dilute it and give it 10 milligrams per ml over 30 minutes. It kind of just depends on the patient's clinical scenario. It can cause hypotension. It can cause neuromuscular weakness. It can cause respiratory depression as you're administering magnesium. So just keep in mind that this is not somebody you're just going to hang the fluid on and walk away. This is a critically ill patient that you're going to need to monitor very carefully. Great. Lastly is low phos levels or hypophosphatemia. And this is, again, something not routinely checked in your metabolic profile, but can be caused by just cellular shifting, respiratory alkalosis, insulin administration, DKA, sepsis, and things like phosphorus depletion, diarrhea, burns, and Fanconi syndrome. That's great. Because it's basically like you don't absorb phosphorus, glucose, potassium bicarbonate, which is pretty much everything. And then the diagnosis of hypophosphatemia is, again, rarely occurring in isolation. There's usually multiple other things going on. Sometimes it's a parathyroid problem or a vitamin D deficiency, but typically there are other things going on. Treatment is warranted if the level is less than a milligram per deciliter, which can result in things, again, like seizures, coma, problems with cardiac contractility, or even rhabdomyolysis and ventricular arrhythmias. So again, we can see all kinds of ECG manifestations from really severe derangements of any of these electrolytes. Sodium phosphate or potassium phosphate can be used for replacement, and those doses are in the article. You don't have to commit those to memory. Have them at your disposal by just checking the mobile app. Table 7 provides you with electrolyte repletion based on severity. And again, for all of the derangements we talked about today, we're going to look at Table 1, which gives you a good idea of what normal levels are supposed to be. We're looking at Table 2, which tells us by electrolyte abnormality the things that we need to keep in mind for differential diagnosis. And then we're looking at Table 7 for what we're supposed to give and how fast we're supposed to give it based on whether or not it's a mild or moderate case or severe case. You have everything you need in this article at your fingertips to really make the diagnosis and begin resuscitation. Can I give you my high yield points at the end here? Let's do it. One, your mag should be two and your FOS should be two. I don't think I had a normal FOS in my head, but mag and FOS are two. If they're not two, you should probably do something to make them closer to two. There They're the two electrolytes that should be two. That's, it, it made it stick more in my head. And then we haven't talked about my least favorite electrolyte that is always a problem that you always need to make sure you're thinking about, especially now in more in adolescents and teenagers, which is lithium. Bipolar disorder is treated very frequently with lithium. And if you don't ask about it and you don't check it, you're not going to know where the lithium level is. And lithium toxicity can cause real problems. So I would always encourage you to both ask the patient, ask their parents, and check is, and see what their pharmacy records or their old records show. Because if you can catch a lithium toxicity, whether it's from an overdose or just from chronically taking too high of a dose, it's very important to catch that and treat it because that's another electrolyte abnormality that can cause very serious consequences. That's an excellent summary. And I will read to you the five things that will change your practice. First, resuscitate symptomatic hyponatremia until the symptoms stop, but then don't overcorrect, right? So you're using the 3% saline for hyponatremia while they're seizing. As soon as the seizures stop, you're moving on to something less severe, less concentrated. Consider obtaining an ECG. We just talked about all of those different electrolytes and how all of them can cause ECG manifestations. So do it, especially if electrolyte disturbance is on your differential. Remain vigilant about correcting hyperkalemia because of its potential for causing life-threatening dysrhythmias and consider the variety of available agents there. Lots of things you can give intravenously. Number four, in addition to correcting electrolyte derangements, always be aware of concomitant fluid deficits and the need for further volume, right? We talked about euvolemia, 
hypervolemia and hypovolemia and how the treatment is very different when you're looking at low sodium or high sodium for each of those three categories. And lastly, once the resuscitation is complete, you got to move on to the continuous infusions of medications to really make sure that your maintenance administration is appropriate for whatever the electrolyte derangement is. So you've dealt with the emergency. Now you got to continue on with the urgency as you pass them off to hopefully a pediatric ICU or if they're more stable onto the ward. There's so much value to be obtained here for like the patients you're going to see over your career, both children and adults. But I think especially in kids, I think you're going to see one of these cases this year. You're going to see all of these cases in the next 10 years. So it's just a matter of making sure that you're comfortable and not necessarily that you know it all, but you know as much as you can to get things stabilized and started. And then you know where to reach out to. I've had a DKA that came in that was instead of being hyponatremic, the patient was hypernatremic. And I called the ICU and said, hey, look, I know how to treat DKA. I know how to manage. I know how to resuscitate them appropriately with LR. This one makes me feel cautious. Let's talk about how we're going to resuscitate this because I really don't feel like I know. Because I think the sodium was like 150 and the sugar was 1,000. And I said, this is really an ugly picture. And I want to make sure that we agree on how we're going to resuscitate this so that everybody feels good tomorrow good with how we went about fluids and we didn't give too much or too little. And like you said, making sure that you do the stabilizing, but then go through and calculate how much you're going to replete and how fast you're going to do it is a huge, huge takeaway from this. Yeah. And even in that setting, right? If you're going to give a bolus, you're not giving anything other than normal saline or LR. Or you're not going to bolus hypotonic fluids in that patient. So thanks to Dr. Conway for authoring the article. Thank you for listening. If you're listening today and headed into your shift, you may encounter one of these patients today, and I really hope that you've got this article in your back pocket. But I really am thankful that you're listening because maybe we pointed you in the right direction. TR, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Excited for the next article to get excited about next month. <laughs> That's right. It's a constant level of excitement with you. <laughs> and the good news is it's infectious in a good way. It's probably yes. the only kind of infectious thing in the emergency department that we like. Well, friends, that's the end of another episode. Thank you so much for being a listener. I really want you to go to clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net and check out all of that free information there for you and let me know what you think by clicking the feedback button. And I also really want you to go to ebmedicine.net and take a look at all of the wonderful subscription opportunities and ways that you can get CME, not just for listening to this program, but also for reading through the three different publications that come out every month from EB Medicine. Until next time, I'm Sam Mishu. Be safe, everyone. <laughs>